Gabriad here, looking at the second iteration of this uh, dive into the run data of me. But now, thanks to a lot of uh, you know really good Covenant 25 players that were generous enough to send me in their data, uh, we're going to be able to do kind of the first beginnings of a meta analysis. And uh, I will say, out of respect of privacy for the players, uh, I'm not going to look at any of their individual run data. We're only going to look at my individual run data. And then we're just going to look at kind of everybody as a whole. So, uh, but I would like to just uh, give a quick shout out to everyone that did send me data. And for those that have YouTube channels or Twitch streams, I'm going to link them below in the uh the comments or not comment section the details section of this video so uh, please check those out so the first uh, person I'd like to thank is a guy who um, <clears throat> none of this would be possible without he sent me his data but more importantly he helped me build basically everything you see on this dashboard uh, and that is mr. Papos penguins also goes by vision of fire on twitch and uh, Beast of Bones in game. So, uh, huge uh, shout out to you. Uh, thanks so much for everything you've done here. Uh, like I said, I, it's the data isn't uh, super straightforward, and he did so much to help me actually make this happen, um, both technically and just from an idea of, or, or just like an idea standpoint as well. So, huge shout out there. Also, uh, Peanut Jack. Uh, he is the winner of the most recent uh, Open um, Never Nathaniel tournament. So huge thanks to Peanut Jack. Sent us in some pretty good data. Uh, Gentle Giant. He is pretty active on the Steam forums. I haven't seen him too much outside of that, so I didn't uh, know if he streamed or anything like that. Uh, so if you do, Gentle Giant, if you see this, uh, go ahead and send me your link and I can update the uh, description. But um, just a good guy. Sent in a lot of good data. Uh, Night Angel, also his YouTube channel is named Let's Play Analysis, that'll be linked below. Um, also a tournament player, plays pretty high in the tournaments. Really unique play style, very insightful, really good guy, sent in a lot of data. Heart, uh, also goes by It's Tangalicious, but my guess is you probably know him best as Heart if, you're, if you at all pay attention to the daily challenges. Uh, he is probably the most prolific player on it, and... Uh, he sent in a lot of data as well, uh, and also, I, I won't go into it here because I haven't really fleshed it out enough, but there'll probably be another iteration of this data looking at daily challenge specific data. That's not included here. We'll get all into that later though, but uh, Hart still had a lot of good Covenant 25 data to send, so special thanks out to Hart. Um, Asif Baig. I didn't know if you streamed. Uh, last I checked you didn't, but if you have since then, go ahead and tell me and I'll link you below. Uh, really nice guy, part of uh, pretty much all the Monster Train communities. Um, pretty good uh, player, sent in a lot of good player data. Um, Cod Raziel, uh, South African streamer, I'll link that below. He's also a tournament player, also a pretty um, fast player. Like I believe he's getting into speedruns now as well. Uh, sent in a lot of good data. Uh, Bistari, another tournament player, and also a pretty uh, pretty frequent top 10 player. Um, Daily Challenge player. Uh, sent in some good data. Also, Bastari, I, I didn't know if you streamed. Uh, if you do, go ahead and send me in and I'll update it. Rising Dusk, he sent in really, really nice Covenant 25 data. If you know Dusk, he's he's really known as probably the most consistent uh, Covenant 25 player there is. Um, and uh, huge thanks. That was really insightful to me, especially to like kind of see... Um, just how insanely high a win rate can be, aka 100%. <laughs> um, and he stream. Uh, he he has a really nice YouTube channel. I'll link that below. Uh, super insightful, very detail oriented. Um, it's it's pretty awesome. And then uh, also Sanguine Penguin sent in a lot of run data. Super thankful for that as well. Um, he streams very regularly, super insightful, engages with the audience, highly recommend him out. Tournament player as well, tournament winner as well. Um, yeah, and that, I believe, is everybody. 
if I missed anybody, uh, shout at me angrily and I'll, I'll, I'll get you in there. Um, but that's going to be, you know, the, uh, so if you, if you know, you've probably watched tournaments, you probably know a lot of those names. That's a pretty good selection of players here. So we're getting some pretty, some pretty high tier, um, looks into what's happening, right? So without further ado, let's get into my data really quick. Uh, and I will say this is, this is going to be probably split into a few videos. There's just too much to go over in one. And I'd really like to properly geek out on this data instead of just skim over it. So really, I think this video, we're just going to look at some clan specific, uh, information such as, uh, more of the like general win rates and also maybe some more specific clan combo win rates. Um, and then also, uh, take a look at maybe some artifact data. We probably won't get into the card data cause that needs its own video. Honestly, uh, I'll do that very soon. I plan on probably uploading these all in the next two days. Um, but yeah, let's just, let's just get into it here. We'll see how far we get in this video and then I'll find a good stopping point. So, First thing, uh, let's just go over my data really quick to show what's changed. Now, I will say just from a, uh, if you watched the first video I've done on this, there was, there's a few errors I've corrected since then. I wasn't properly filtering out, uh, mutator, assist, uh, or runs that had mutators. Uh, and that was negatively affecting my, my win rate. So just naturally fixing that already pushed it up. But also you'll see as I scroll down here, I've just been, I've been using the insight gained here to really try to up my game. And I, I believe I've done that in the last month and we'll, we'll see, we'll see that kind of shown in the data as well. Uh, and also I got to apologize, you know, every player that sent me data, I would send them a report back. The first few players that sent it in had, uh, you, you'll have had lower win rates than you actually had because I hadn't fixed that mutator bug. So to the few of you that that actually applies to you, feel free to just let me know if you want an updated, um, report and I can do that. Uh, but anyway, you know, uh, looking at this, um, this is just win rate by primary clan. And I'm looking just from March 25th on just only DLC data. That's all I'm really interested in. Uh, and I will say, like I said, I'm not going to look at any other players, individual data here out of respect for privacy, but I will say, um, this is not that uncommon to see patterns like this in every player. Uh, but the clan is always different. I actually looked through and it was, it was pretty amazing in that every single player or every single clan had a representation of a player that had them as their best clan and also as their worst clan. So for instance, there were people, you know, it, it, I, it's always kind of commonly said that melting remnant is the best clan and that maybe Umbra's the worst, uh, as I hear that, I hear that a lot. Um, there were plenty where there, there was players, there's more than one player where Melting Remnant was their worst clan. And there was uh, one player where Umbra was their best clan, but I'm not going to say who it was, of course. Um, but that's, and every iteration was, that was the same. Like there was a player that had Wormkin as their best, Stygian as their best. Me, I got the Hellhorn as the best you can see here. I'm, I'm definitely a Hellhorn type guy, shall we say. But it's also interesting, you know, um, and I will say, we'll look into it uh, down below. My stitch and guard win rate is a bit affected by the fact that I did hammer out a lot of Tethys dregs trying to figure that combo out. And as a result, it really just lowered my stitch and win rate. I think I still would say Tethys is my worst in the DLC, but this is probably a bit lower than it needs to be. Um, but anyway, uh, Hellhorn is my best primary, 75% win rate. And Umbra is actually the second, which I guess isn't too surprising because Primordium is a pretty good champion, right? It might not even be that Umbra is necessarily super good. Uh, but we'll, in, in a minute, I'll go over that. Uh, Wormkin is up there, which is, which is surprising, right? Because Wormkin is the one I've had the least practice with. Uh, you know, I've only had these three months with that clan, but that can kind of show that it is a pretty powerful, um, clan. At least the champs are, right? If you're looking at primary, a lot of, a lot of the power level here is in the champs. Uh, along with the clan as a whole. Uh, Melting Remnant is actually just barely fourth here, um, right there with Awoken, which is interesting, right? You know, we typically think that uh, Melting Remnant is the best, and for a lot it is, but for me it's not. 
Um, a lot of that has to do that I'm I'm still learning the dregs variant. I'm getting better, but uh, there was a while I was I was losing a lot with the dregs variant, shall we say. And Awoken, I've always felt pretty middle of the road on this. Um, obviously, some other players don't though. There were several players where Awoken was their best clan. Um, but uh, yeah, mine. Really, all of them are about in the mix here, with Hellhorn having a clear advantage and Stygian having a clear disadvantage. Now, as far as secondary goes, I get even better with Hellhorn as a secondary, which might elude that I've I slightly overrate the champs here, but it's hard to say. Seventy-five percent win rate is still really high. Eighty. It's like a, when you're trying to compare that, it's kind of apples to oranges. Um, so super good with Hellhorn. Awoken secondary pretty good. And uh, spoiler alert, you'd think root seeds, right? With me, it's not. Restore is like my secondary that's crushing it. I can't explain that. That's just how it is. I don't know. There's no real reason that should be the case, but that's how it has been. Um, Umbra, still up there. So, like I said, I, I was like, okay, this makes sense. Primordium's really good, but maybe Umbra still sucks, right? Well, not really. I think there's design issues kind of with the clan but overall power rate looks pretty strong at least at least for me i'm i'm winning uh over 60 percent on either iteration of it right primary or secondary um and melting remnant secondary is actually my lowest and i will say that's because of dregs we'll have evidence of that below but that's that's pretty wild right because melting remnant there's a lot of strong cards in that in that class right but as I said, that's also because I ran several runs of Tethys Dregs, and and I didn't win too many of them, let's put it that way. But yeah, so on and so forth. You know, clear advantage of Hellhorn and Awoken for me on the secondaries, and then everything else is pretty similar. Um, kind of around that 50 to 55 to 60% win rate uh, range. And now uh, I've added a blended clan um, win rate. What I'm doing here is I'm basically saying I don't care if it's primary or secondary. Just what if I if I merge the clans and say like, hey, if the clan was in, if Hellhorn was involved, and I got a win, it's a win. If Hellhorn was involved and I got a loss, it's a loss. What do my win rates look like then? Um, then it kind of then it, you kind of see the blending of these. Uh, Hellhorn's still way out ahead at 77 percent. Um, Awoken. Uh, pretty far up there still and then it kind of you know umbra's ironically my third best clan as much as i've complained about umbra <laughs> i'm actually maybe i shouldn't complain about them that much right um anyway uh wormkin up there melting remnants starting to fall off and then stygian just kind of suffering mainly because of tethys and then we can see that a bit more here i did the blended but i split out exiled and non-exiled here so crazy how close Awoken is, actually. Like, you'd think there'd be a big difference, right? Because Restore just doesn't seem as good as uh, as Root Seeds. But for me, they're, like, all pretty much... I they are identical, actually. That's pretty crazy, because I've played a lot of runs. And for them to be identical is pretty, pretty crazy. But anyway, Hellhorn Exiled is my best. No surprise there. I'm surprised when I see so many people bash Queen's Impling as a basic... That's wild to me. To me, that's one of the best basics in the game. Uh, but then still Torch variant, Hellhorn, still pretty high, right? 75% uh, versus 80%. And uh, now here we see the gigantic gap, right? Like, Exiled Melting, that I get the win rate I might expect to see of Melting, 72%. But drag variant, I'm under 50%, 48%, right? 48.9%. Um, so clearly I got to shore up my game with drags. And I've been doing that. I do think I've been getting better, but it's going to take a while to close that gap, right? It's a lot of data to, <laughs> to have to overcome now. I've kind of dug my hole deep. But uh, very interesting. And I will say not every player is like this. So a lot of these, it's interesting, right? What I think of when I get the meta analysis is I, I, I can I can get a certain amount of insights, but I can also see certain areas where it's like I'll see things like this where clearly I am doing dregs wrong. But I'll see other things too where it's like clearly when we when we start uh looking at everybody's data as a whole, you'll notice like exiled hellhorn struggles a bit. Um, particularly as like a secondary. 
and uh, I just and just certain banner units and stuff. Like I said, we're not getting to the card ones in this video, but I just see you can see evidence where I'm clearly doing something wrong, but you can also see evidence where I'm doing something right and everybody else is doing something wrong. So it's like the way I generally look at a lot of this stuff is I don't look at the low end too much as much as the high end. Like when I see something does well, then I know it's good. Like with when you get all these good players together and certain cards just always do good, you know that card's good. But if a card does bad, that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Um, that is... Or even a clan, right? Uh, if a clan does bad... That doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Like, Tethys Dregs might not even be that bad, right? I, I, Even though I've lost so many times with it, I'm not willing to go and say Tethys just straight up is bad because there are players, I checked, uh, and Tethys is their strongest champ. So, you know, it, it's interesting. Like, you can only, you have to take the context a lot of times with a lot of this data. But you see that here as well. Like, um, they, there's a gigantic gap. So just to reiterate, there is a, what is that? 40, 72 minus 48. It's like a 20, what is that? 26 percent or something difference. That's that's pretty wild. Um, but similarly with Stygian uh, exiled and Stygian non exiled gigantic gap like 25 percent it's pretty wild um but that's just me like i have to shore things up right and another actually another good example is i i tend to do pretty good with soul guard and also stitch in exile whereas a lot of other players uh didn't which to me i'm like well i know from my experience that it's good even though the data wouldn't show that if i'm only looking at their data right so again i just tend to look at the good and take the bad with the finest grades. Uh, the, 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 the low win rates I take with the, 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 fi the finest grain of salts. It, that more I just look at it. I look at that as like I need to shore up my game in those areas. And that's the main way I've been trying to use this. So I think that's the only way you can get better, right? And then Umbra to Umbra Exiled. Interesting, there's a, there's a somewhat of a significant gap, 8%. It's not nothing, right? You might be able to explain a lot of that with Primordium, but we'll get into that in a bit here. And then Wormkin... Probably one of the few where Exile doesn't win, right? Um, and that, that makes sense. I do. I, I particularly just prefer Spine Chief, and I particularly prefer Fracture. So both secondary and primary, I prefer the non-Exiled Wormkin variants. But they're both really good. It's it's kind of apples and oranges, to be honest. Um, there's only a five percent difference. But yeah, for most of these, Exile typically beats out the non-Exiled. <clears throat> and then here's kind of uh, uh, bucketed by month, just kind of my win rate over time. And you can see maybe the scale here doesn't uh, make it that clear, but uh, I've definitely gotten better in July. Like I had some, I was all over the place kind of those first three months. Started to get a little bit more tight June, but particularly July, like I have a 100% win rate primary Hellhorned. And everything else, the lowest is Stygian at 66, so clearly I'm getting better, right? Like my Stygian primary above overall was like under 50, right? So I'm trending in the right direction. I've used I've used a, a lot of data here to try to to try to reevaluate cards and, and and just strategies in general. Um, and then secondary. You know, similar, lowest is melting at 63, which is still pretty high by my standards, right? My overall win rate's all around there, so, you know, just getting better, getting better. Awoken Secondary has done very well for me this month, but definitely getting better, which is the good thing to see. And then total wins, you can also see I've just simply played more also in July than June. I was kind of a little bit, maybe a bit discouraged in June, but I have been reinvigorated um, for my love of this game lately uh it keeps pulling me back in i i none of the other games really satisfy me the way monster train does and then here we get really really specific um now we're just saying primary of exiled and secondary of you know exiled versus non-exiled fortunately color coding wasn't working for me here i'll have to figure that out later but uh for primary not a huge difference in awoken 
Um, I'm. It, it's weird because I really have started to hate uh, Wildenton lately, but it is interesting that I'm doing technically better with Wildenton than I am with Sentient because I don't typically mind Sentient too much. I will say, though, my Sentient game has some holes. I'll probably have to get into that in another video uh, when we really dive into the champion-specific stats. But I don't think we're going to have time for that on this one. We're already at about 20 minutes here, and I haven't even gone into like all the players um, as a whole yet. So, interestingly enough, I'm dead even with Hellhorn. Uh, Shardtail versus um, Prince. And honestly... I don't always utilize the champs, right? I like I like them, but Hellhorn to me is so powerful that you really don't need them. You can just set up your banners, get some good infusions, get some good spells or imps or both, and you're going to be good. Um, but, you know, shout out to the Hellhorn guide if you want more on that. Uh, Melting Run and Exiled, so that's going to be a little fade. No surprise there that it's, like, the highest, right? That and Primordium are tied at 80. Um pretty wild but uh it's also pretty wild that there's so many even numbers here that hasn't always been the case but i'm just noticing that now it's like 80 75 because clearly you know if, if it's not a whole number it will print it out as such anyway um but yeah you see the big gap here um i am getting better with rector but i've especially those first three months i really struggled with rector um to, to try to figure him out but i actually i actually don't like, I don't dread seeing Rector anymore. I feel I'm feeling more and more comfortable with him, so I'm hoping to uh, even that gap because I do think Rector is a very strong champ, possibly one of the best champs in the game. But yeah, no surprises here that they on the eighty percent win rate of Little Fade. I'd I'd even say the surprise is that it isn't higher, right? To me, it just seems free win. But I've I've thrown away some pretty free wins with it too. Uh, Soul Guard, we see that big gap. 38% win rate with Tethys, not so great. But 63% with Soul Guard, pretty decent. Pretty crazy, the, uh, you know, almost, uh, was that, 25% gap there. But, you know, it happens. Uh, like I said, a lot of that's from the Tethys dregs that I ran for like 20 games or so. That's going to do that. And we know the Umbra, there's that big gap too. Penumbra, I'm not, I, I don't really think Penumbra's very good. And that's kind of shown here, right? giant gap 25 percent as well um wormkin this is uh another one or like so really if you look at these there's only one um primary where non-exiled wins out and that's wormkin for me at least it's different for the other players but spine chief gets that kind of just really good win rate and echo right not as good that could just be me messing up with Echorite, but I, I've always personally thought Echorite's a little bit overrated. Um, I think it's pretty prone to bad starts where you don't get offered Martial Lord uh, and you don't get any consumables. I think it's a, one of the worst ring ones possible at that point. And I think those kind of get overlooked when people evaluate the champ because it, it's just a very swingy champ, right? Like, it'll either carry the hell out of your run or it will just make you lose early game. Um, that's kind of my evaluation of Echo Right. But that is neither here nor there. Now we go to the second uh, secondary clans, and pretty even with uh, Awoken. But like I said, technically, the non-exiled is the Restores. So I do better with Restores than Root Seeds. And I, I can't explain that. I really can't. And when we look at other players' data, spoiler alert, it's not like that. It is way the opposite. Like, Root Seeds has a clear advantage in the other players' data, which is what you'd expect to see, right? Like, how does it make any sense Restores as a secondary would beat out Root Seeds? So that just shows the variance in the data. Also, just just that you have to really take a lot of this with a grain of salt. But, uh, but who knows? Maybe Restores has some hidden thing that I am not realizing you know it's hard to really evaluate everything in a run when you're playing it right that's what's nice about these data analysis is can make you really think right and then like i said the hellhorn exiled secondary is my best out of everything like even these it's better than little fade primary 84 percent with um queen zimpling so you and and this you don't see with the other players really as uh as well like like I don't even know that it outperforms Torch in their data, 
but to me i'm like i don't know these these things are just amazing they do a ton of damage early game they're relevant as chump blockers the entire game they give you tons of imp synergy it's a f uh, the fact they're in your deck means if you find transcend imp it's a free win pretty much there's just a lot going on for queen simplings but i will d as par probably another follow-up video i'm gonna really dive into like both the champs and the basics and give kind of my thoughts on like a uh, data-based and bias like data and just bias mixed together to make a tier list uh, hopefully that made sense but yeah torch is still pretty high at 76 percent um just not nearly as good as queen simpling for me and then here we see a gigantic gap again no surprise to me here uh, melting remnant pri the primitive mold just seems like such a good basic to me to me it's actually the best basic even better than queen simplings um it enables the entirety of the melting kit right from the get-go the problem with dregs is you don't always get reform and then it becomes a bit awkward right it's like okay do i take this draft i know draft infusion is great i know drafts itself can be great but if i have no reform um how am I going to make a burnout one unit stick, even if I have burnout extension, right? Uh, I can I can work with dark calling, but again, what if I don't have reform or dark calling? That's not that unlikely of a scenario. Almost, <laughs> it seems like most of my games actually end up that way. But uh, yeah, but like I said, there are players that still do very well with Drake's secondary. Um, so I don't necessarily look at this as like Drake's are horrible. It's just they're horrible with me right and then gigantic gap here this one i think really um you know i think forgotten power might be the most underrated basic other than queen simpling i never see this get much love and it's pretty wild to me that it doesn't yeah it's frustrating it is a frustrating card but the you can't deny the fact that it costs zero you can't deny the fact that it does tons of damage Especially like early game, it can pretty much kill the bosses, or at least take them down to half health entirely on its own. Even a Fracture can't hardly do that, right? Um, but, you know, we'll get into all that in another video. And then Spears, no surprise here, I, th I think Spears might be the worst uh, basic. I, I didn't think so pre-DLC, because I always really liked them, particularly with Conduit. Um, Tethys, but now that Conduit Tethys, it, I mean, Conduit Tethys is still good, but I don't find it as free of a win as it was before. Uh, well, it doesn't matter, because it's secondary. We're talking about secondary spears. I, I, there's just not really any strength that I can see in this, having these spears as your secondary. They're horrible. They do six damage. Um, they cost an ember. They don't discard anything. They just don't provide you anything, right? They're horrible. They don't kill a backliner, they can't sacrifice their own units, they can't generate a morsel, they just, they are so bad. Um, and then Umbra exiled to non-exiled. Um, no huge surprise here, it's one of the few where the exiled does not, uh, the exiled uh, basic does not perform as well as the non-exiled basic, but there's no surprise here, right? Plinks are not that great. Dare I say they're underrated, though. I do think they're underrated, but let's be honest, they're not that great. And uh, it's much better to just generate a morsel, right? You, especially considering if you do get Umbra Banner units, they're completely morsel reliant. And you really, especially in the DLC, Plinks are not going to be a reliable way for you to generate morsels. So... If you happen to low roll and not get additional morsel generation early, and you have to rely on, say, an alloy that has to fuel to attack, you can be pretty screwed with the uh, flinks. And then, uh, Wormkin's pretty even here. I don't even think it's really worth saying one's better than the other. I like both of them for what it's worth. You know, the exiled one is just a better torch, um, and the non exiled one is just pretty versatile. It, it has the disadvantage that if you play it on the floor with your that your people are at, you won't prevent the damage. But that's really the only downside. It's it actually is better than uh, Echo Break in all other forms. It just does more damage. It um, applies debuffs. You can use it on like your own units a little bit more for a little bit more um, 
synergies, I think. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it there. And this is probably not that interesting. I think now what I'm going to do is let's just go over everything we went over and look at it from the perspective of the uh, of every player as a whole. So I'm just going to change this to um, everybody. And let's take a look just how the primaries shape out. Uh, so, you know, I'll sort it by win rate here. Melting Remnant is the best. Um, and then Umbra is second. Isn't that crazy? Wormkin, newest clan, coming in at third. Then Awoken, then Hellhorn, then Stygian Guard. Now, I will say... Um, this makes it look a little bit uneven, right? But there's two problems right now that I would say I would change. One is that my data is in there, and to be honest, I have played so much of this game um, that I have, you know, I have almost as much as every other player combined. It says something about my life, but anyway. Um, so I'm going to remove me from this. And then also there is one player here that uh, at least on one account was really just only playing melting and I think it kind of skews the results as well so I'm not going to say uh, again out of uh, respect for the players I'm not going to say who it is I just made a little macro here to hide the skewer now what we get is a bit more, a bit more, um, a bit more even of a spread for primaries, right? So Melting Remnant still number one, but not like vastly in number one. Umbra right behind, and then it starts to fall off, kind of. Um, I mean, Wormkin's right there at forty-five. Awoken Stygian. I was bringing Stygian down, by the way. Um, and then Hellhorn, ironically, at the very bottom. And if you remember me. I was, by far, my best was Hellhorn, so that just shows, like, you could look at this one way, you could say, uh, say my data was never there, you might start to think, oh, is Hellhorn just the worst primary clan in the game? Uh, you could say that, but again, this is why I always say, when you look at data like this, I only really look at the top. What I know from this is that Melting is pretty good and Umbra is probably pretty good. I don't necessarily say Hellhorn is bad, right? Plus, I have the knowledge from my own data that Hellhorn should be pretty good, right? So that's just to reiterate kind of the differences. And it also kind of goes into showing that, like like I said, every player has vastly different uh, stuff that they're good at. Really what I think this comes down to is, like, it, this game is way deeper than I think a lot of people give it credit for. And you can't really be good and know you can't be good with everything unless you play an absolute shitload and you also it's hard to know all the strategies i'm still finding out strategies right like just recently in the last week have i started using endless eggs right before that i thought it was crap but now i'm like damn it's one of the potentially best strategies in the game so you know you'll never know every strategy really um I aspire to, I aspire to, but realistically, every player has the things they're good at, and they have the things they're bad at. Um, so it's always interesting. The more and more data I get, I think the more and more we can start to trust some of the trends, but right now I have to take everything with a, a grain of salt, right? So that's the primaries. Let's do the same exercise for secondaries. So um, I'll just go ahead and uh, jump right to um, eliminating me, and then uh, eliminating the skewed results and what we get there as secondaries is actually even more of an even spread I would say interestingly enough we got Awoken as the best secondary and that is not out too outrageous right um, that's always even before the DLC dropped that's kind of been the notion, right? Awoken is like the prime secondary clan that you can have, right? For me, it's different, of course. Um, Hellhorned is mine just because I've come to... I feel like I know the ins and outs of Hellhorn so much now. And honestly, it helped, when I made that guide, uh, I was already doing pretty good with Hellhorn before it, but even just making those guides sometimes helps me as a player uh, because it really reinforces me 
to actually write down a strategy and put it on paper, right? Other than just have it floating around in my head. And uh, But anyway, uh, you know, Awoken, Hellhorn goes way up. Remember in the last, um, when we did the same look at primary, it was the worst at under 40%. But now it's right there, almost number one at forty-eight percent. So that, and that's really interesting to me. That that shows to me that they're they're either using the champs maybe incorrectly, the Hellhorn champs. Um, really, that is, I guess, what it shows me. Uh, because, yeah, maybe the champs aren't that great for Hellhorn. I think they're great, but um, uh, I don't know. It, it is kind of telling that Hellhorn was the worst primary for everybody. Um, Stitch and Guard is up in the mix. Very interestingly, um, well, well, we'll get into that later, but yeah, third for St Stitch and then Umbra's at fourth. No huge surprise there. Plinks, Plinks are in the mix there. And even Shade Splitters is a secondary. It's like, eh, they're, they're okay. Wormkin, I was a bit surprised to see. I think people are still ironing at... Uh, uh, ironing out Wormkin, but then the Melting Remnant was the biggest surprise to me. I was like, well, yeah, the Melting Champs are pretty busted, but Melting as a clan seems really good. At least Primitive Molds, right? Not really the case uh, with all the players' data. Um, and we'll get into the specifics here, because this is... Keep in mind, this is not taking to, into account Exiled or non-Exiled. It's blending those together. So we'll look at that data next, but I'd like to get really quick just the blended... Um, not what I clicked. Uh, just really quick, I'd like to look at the blended uh, data because in here we start to uh, we start to see something that's really interesting to me. Um, that's all I gotta do, right? So this is blended. Um, you know, just uh, let's go to the visualization. Um, it's all pretty even, right? Which is pretty wild. That and to this, to this, I really got to give credits uh, to the dev team. Um, in a game where there's six clans and so many different combos between them, there's exiled, non-exiled variants. There's all the champs that also have exiled and non-exiled variants. All these different plethora of strategies. When you look at the clans from a just holistic perspective, the win rate, it's only f what, 5-4% um, difference between top to bottom. That's not too bad, right? 4%. Four, 4 That's a pretty amazing... Uh, that just shows that how well just the just everything has been designed about these clans. True individual um, champs probably are pretty imbalanced we'll get into that later but just as a whole everything kind of evens out which is pretty amazing to see so awoken does have the highest blended rate at 47 percent and then the lowest would be stygian but not really by much right like they're all like hellhorn stygian wormkin are all within a percent of each other even less than a percent of each other umbra second and then melting uh third i gotta say though Umbra gets shit on the most. They're clearly pretty good. And I still agree with the points that basically always get brought up. The complaints about Umbra. Kind of the how all the banner units kind of rely on morsels and whatnot. And that Divinity shits on morsels most of the time outside of a few specific cards or artifacts. I agree with all those uh, critiques, but it is interesting that just on a power level, Umbra is the second best clan for everybody. So very interesting there. Um, and we can also do the same exercise for blended, but taking into factor, uh, you know, the uh, exiled and, and non-exiled. So we'll do the same. Um, now it's starting to open up a bit, right? So Awoken Exile actually clearly has the lead here. It's the Root Seeds and Wildenton. Or uh, it, it could have Wildenton or it could not, but it, you know, Root Seeds are always involved. Uh, big gap between the two. Um, 
Hellhorned is a bit more close, but it is interesting that, like I said, remember my data always had a had it better for a Hellhorn XL, but for everyone else, it's the opposite. Um, not a huge difference, but it is worth noting that Torch variant seems to do better. Um, melting. I'll be honest, I expect to see a bigger gap here, right? Um, I expect to see two things, I suppose. I expect to see Melting Remnant Exiled as actually the best. I wouldn't expect Awoken to be the best. I would have expected Melting Remnant, but it's not. Uh, and also the gap, 8% is big, but mine was like, what, 25%? So there's less of a difference between Primitive Mold and Dregs for the other players. So like I said, that's good evidence for me that my drag game needs to step up, right? Um, Stygian, pretty close. Exiled is better, which I think goes against the common things that I've seen where, like, Forgotten Power gets shit on, Spears don't really get shit on as much. Uh, also, Soulguard seems to get shit on. I think Tethys generally gets shit on, but right here it's it does look like uh, overall every player is generally doing better with the Exiled Stygian. Only by 4% or so, though. And then this one's fucking wild, right? Like, Umbra non-exiled has, uh, what, 6%? Or what is that? Yeah, 6%, 6 plus 2, 7, 8, 9, or like 9, I don't know, whatever. I can't math right now, but there's whatever the, whatever 49 minus 42 is, that should be 7, right? Duh. 7% difference. Um... And, uh, I mean, I guess, yeah, Exiled has the Plinks, but Exiled also has Primordium. So I would have thought Primordium would have outperformed the Plinks, so to speak, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, maybe the Shade Splitters are p more powerful than we're giving them credit for, right? And then Wormkin, uh, for them, it's kind of the opposite of me. I mean, granted, I, I was pretty even, but they have a clear advantage on the exiled variant versus the non-exiled variant. Uh, almost 10%, 9% it looks like. So pretty interesting there. And then let's get into, we don't care about that really, um, the really specific stuff here, which is... the first look at the primaries. So let's sort it by win rate. So Melting Remnant Exiled gets the nod. Um, not so really surprises there. We've always known Firelight is busted. There's like no bad path for it. There's no not great path for it, right? It's just busted. So that also Primordium is in second. Um, also no surprises. Primordium is pretty crazy. And then here we get Echorite. So this starts, you know, like I said, I did say I found work. Uh, Echorite to be slightly overrated, but uh, maybe that's just wrong. Uh, every other player is doing pretty well with um, Echorite compared to the other clan, uh, the other champs, right? Because really, what we're looking at here is obviously some combo of the champ and the clan's and the clan's power as a whole. But when you see like big gaps, um, like for instance, for them the Spine Chief variants, you know, when you look at Wormkin Primary XL versus Wormkin Primary non XL, the main difference there, the only two differences are going to be Echo Break versus Fractured, and then Champ versus Champ. Uh, and really, you know, I would think Champ versus Champ is the big difference here, because I don't see a huge difference between Fractured and Echo Breaks. Uh, and this is one where, to me, it... I know from my own data, when we looked at it, that there's no way Spine Chief is bad, right? To me, this just tells me people are not using Spine Chief correctly. Uh, there really is no reason it should be the second worst. But it is worth noting also that clearly, in a general sense, people are doing much better with Echo Right versus Spine Chief. Um, so that's also something worth noting, right? That means that maybe... If you don't have a few specific things that you know about with Spine Chief, like I see a lot of people pick Infector, and I'm like, eh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> it's 
it's good, but uh, you just if you really want to win, Corruptor and Decay are such free wins usually. Whereas Infector is absolutely not a free win. That's you have to make a lot of things work with Infector. Still a good champ path. Like if they ever, if they ever nerf Corruptor or Decay to Oblivion and keep Infector the same, I'd probably run Infector more. But you know, really, it's like I don't know. The, the, there's a few things that probably just aren't getting utilized there. But um, Awoken Exile, that's an interesting one to me that it's fourth, because I have come to hate Wilden 10 lately. Um, I think it's... I, I just don't like the unit, even though technically, according to the data, I'm doing pretty good with it uh, compared to other champs, um, or other just primary clans. Um... I don't know. It just doesn't feel like that strong of a champ to me. And the general sentiment I get from most of the community echoes that. I don't think most people have liked Wildenton in the DLC. But it is pretty crazy that technically it has done fourth best for uh, some pretty a pretty good spread of players here, right? These are, you know, we have multiple tournament winners here. We have some of the highest win rate Covenant 25 players. We have just, you know, really good players, and hey, um, Wildenton is fourth best among them. Hard to ignore that. And another one, another surprise here, frickin' Penumbra. I've always, I, I've been back and forth on Penumbra, but right now my thought is that I don't like it that much, but it's fifth best for them. Hard to deny that. Um, and by the way, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna add back the, um, I'm going to hide, just show kind of why I'm hiding the skewing of results here and mine. Um, I'm adding the skewed results back in. Uh, this really changes it. Like I said, the, the, the results that I'm hiding here, and maybe I'm, maybe this is not good because it's gaming the system, so to speak, but I just felt that there was basically a player that had so many, um, Rector games played. And at basically a 100% win rate, that it it was skewing the results enough that it was like if I'm really wanting to know the general um, trends here, this doesn't really reflect it, right? Because when we looked at it, it was completely different. If I just eliminate the one that one player, right? But it is worth noting that clearly Rector is good. There's no denying that, right? If a player can play that much and win with it that much. We aren't. We the rest of us need to sh need to step up, you know. <laughs> but I will, you know. Let's go back just to reiterate. It goes from clearly the number one. I hide that player, and now it's number six, which still isn't bad. But it went from a sixty-seven percent win rate to a forty-four percent win rate. Just shows that you know when you specialize in something, you can get really good at it, and. I wouldn't be surprised, like, if a player really did that with any of these, they might be able to really, like, who knows, maybe if you if you really loved Penumbra and just started only playing Penumbra, you might be able to do similar, like, get to basically a 100% win rate. It's like, I, I every champ seems to be good, right? It's just, with a, if you don't really know all the ins and outs of them, Spine Chief, for example, like, I know all the ins and outs, really, of Spine Chief. Not all of them. That sounded pretty cocky, right? But I know a lot of ins and outs of Spine Chief that allow me to get, I think I was at, like, a 71% win rate there. But if you don't know those, it can be a pretty bad champ. Any any of these three pip champs, that's a lot of pip to uh, dedicate to a floor, and if you're not really utilizing that, it's hard to do much with it, right? But, you know, so on and so forth here. The uh, Soul Guard is at seven um, sentience down there. Uh, both the Hellhorn champs don't seem to be doing very good. Like I said, they were the lowest on the primary for the rest of the players. 40% for Shardtail Queen. And a, a pretty bad 37% here for, uh, for the Prince. And I, you know, that doesn't surprise me. Prince, I, as a Hellhorn... Virtue, so we say a, hell, a hell-horned lover, right? I don't even love Prince that much. Um, I, I've been getting better with him. I think that, I think that Wrathful's maybe a bit more takeable than we've given it credit for. Even Reaper, maybe. But uh, 
it doesn't surprise me that this one's that that low. It does kind of surprise me that Spine Chief is because I feel like, you know, there's been some pretty good guides that have uh, come out for Wormkin, but maybe just nobody has really seen them. Like there was a pretty good Night Angel guide. There's a pretty good Night uh, uh, Never Nathaniel guide. There's a really good Rising Dusk guide. You should check check all those out. They'll if you're having Wormkin um, problems. Go ahead and check them out. And uh, I, I, I myself plan on doing a Wormkin guide pretty soon too. Like maybe as soon as next week, I might kick off the first part of it. Uh, I've I really enjoy the clan, but yeah. Uh, I think that uh, Spine Chief still is kind of a you either know him or you don't type champ right now, and a lot of people just haven't figured it out. But that's pretty much that. Let's go take a look at the secondaries. Same type of uh, exercise. Will hide me and uh, the skewed results. And uh, here we get the awoken uh, spread that you might expect to see. Because remember, my restore variant was for some reason better as a secondary than root seeds. But with every, when you look at all the other players, it's a different story. It's more what you'd expect. It's like 60% win rate with root seeds versus 42% with restore. Which makes sense to me. I mean, root seeds are so good, right? They give you a, they give you already a natural form of damage scaling, and it cycles itself, allowing you to fill up your hand the following turn. That will never not be good, and most of the time it's going to be really good. Whereas restore, it's like, especially like even early game, it basically does nothing outside of, uh, if you somehow have, I, I mean, honestly, as a secondary ring one, it does nothing. There's no chance at Cultivate procs. You don't have a banner unit yet. Your champ would not obviously not have Cultivate procs. Best you could hope for is like maybe it can incant your Soul Guard or something. <laughs> That's like about it. Um, you can slightly heal people. It's a very bad Ring 1 card, and it doesn't seem amazing to me like at all the other rings. It obviously can be pretty good with Cultivate, but... Yeah, I can't explain why my restores do so much better than root seeds. But that is how it is. But this is more what we expect. And then uh, Umbra Shade Splitter. Here we go, right? Like I said, I think we've been not giving Shade Splitters the love that they probably deserve. You look at all these other players, it is the second best uh, secondary. And you know, compared to Plinks, which is the number, the number one worst, right? Weird way to phrase it, but it's the number one worst. So, morsels, and that's the only difference, right? The only difference when you're looking at, at a clan's secondary is the basics. So, that's really just comparing Shade Splitter to uh, Plink. Pretty big difference, 20% difference. <laughs> Over a lot, you know, 10 or so players, um, significant run data. Um, and here we see Forgone Power. Like I said, I think it's highly underrated. This is Forgone Power, the zero cost discard apply frostbite card, third best, 50%. Spears secondary, 41%. Big difference, right? This is what I expect to see. I think Spears suck. I think Forgone Power is good. Hellhorn secondary, we see actually pretty good here, both of them. And actually, they, like I said, they Torch does have an advantage for them, but it's not huge. 2% is pretty kind of whatever. Uh, but, you know, hard, you know, uh, Torch kind of always, it, it has a lot of mixed feelings, but I think people generally do like it. And I agree with that. I think it's pretty good. I don't think it's great, but it's good. Whereas I think the Queen Simplings are great. I, I don't think I know any other player that thinks that. Um, maybe maybe I can convince people now that we're starting to look at the data and whatnot, but I would say at least if they like torches um, and they hate Queen Simplings, maybe reevaluate it, because it seems here, based on most players' data, that there's not that big of a difference between them, right? But anyway, um, Echo Break does seem to have a pretty big... well, not really. Not big. It's just 1%. Pretty negligible. When you get to here, it's pretty negligible between them all. This one I didn't expect to see, though. Um, Primitive Mold Secondary, as one of the lower win rates, is not at all what I would have expected to see. To me, 
Yeah, it can be a weird ring one sometimes, but like I said, in general, it just kind of opens up all of the Melting Remnant game plan right from the start, you know, just having all those reforms. I've always thought it's, like, I, I thought it would be the most powerful secondary. Even in my own data, that's not reflected, though. It is one of the more powerful ones. Like, um, it isn't the most powerful. And then Dregs down there, I don't really, no surprises there. Like I said, I'm not huge on dregs. And as a secondary, even if I add um, the skewed results back in, there is, uh, you'll see those dregs shoot up, but not, there's, they still don't shoot up above uh, primitive mold, right? And not even above a lot of these others. So even with the player that is, you know, kind of a, um, a virtuoso, shall we say, of uh, of melting remnant, uh, even they their dregs were not good as a secondary. I think they were able to make them work pretty well with Rector, but uh, I think dregs as a secondary is 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 pretty weak. But like I said, like I said, even though all of us have not done good with dregs as a secondary, there could be somebody that does end up figuring out how to really crush it with dregs as a secondary. So even here, even here with this evidence, I don't really want to make the statement that dregs suck, necessarily. I'll just say that with all of us, they have sucked. But it might be good. But I, what I can say is that root seeds are definitely good. There's no denying that, right? When you have all of us players in here, and that uh, this uh, secondary of Awoken XL has this high win rate, there's no denying that root seeds are good. Uh, that's the way I kind of look at it. And we were also going to look at, not the cards today, well, well, well today we might, but just in a different video. Um, we were going to look at the artifacts, right? Um, so let's take a quick look at the artifacts. I think the video is almost about an hour long already, so I'll probably have to cut it uh, pretty soon. But I think artifacts will be pretty quick. There's not not necessarily a whole lot to go over here, so let's look at mine, my stats really quick. So if we look at it from a total win count perspective, um, these, th uh, well, these four here, Wormtooth obviously just means you had Wormkin, but Herzl's Compound, that's the draw upgrade that you get uh, for your Pyre. Light of Seraph, that's the pip upgrade, and Fell's Remorse is the Ember upgrade. And this doesn't surprise me too much. I'm generally always going to prioritize a draw upgrade over the others. Um, and Ember is usually my least taken one. It's a little bit more specific to certain runs. It is worth noting, though, that it technically has my highest win rate of the three. And Pip has the lowest. That doesn't surprise me too much. I think Pip is a really hard one to evaluate when it is, like, to, to, to evaluate that it's the correct call. Because honestly, from a value perspective, the pip is probably the least valuable in a general sense. But some builds just need that pip, right? I would never take the pip one if I was trying to evaluate the value between them. The pip really should just be taken when that is what's going to like drive your deck over the edge. Or alternatively, if it, that's the only way your game plan is going to work, is if you have that extra pip. But in general, draw will never be bad. Ember could be bad. It, it's pretty pointless to take an Ember upgrade if you have no big reason to have it. But if you do have reason to have it, similar to Pip, that's just going to enable your game plan, right? Uh, and then uh, this is not, by the way, we'll, we'll look at every player as well, but uh, that is not that um, different from the other players. They, they basically choose them at the same rates, roughly. And then we get into the sort of normal artifacts here, right? Hell's Banners is the number one. No surprise there. It's like pretty damn rare that I see a Hell's Banners and I don't take it. I gotta get. I gotta have a pretty big reason to take a different artifact. This artifact just does. It, 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 at the very least, what it what it'll do is a, essentially give you what an improved firebox does, minus just a few ember. But you know, you're always guaranteed to get your at least one banner unit in your champ turn one, so at the very least, turn one, you're getting three extra ember, which is already good enough if that was all it did, right? 
If there if if they nerfed improved firebox to just only give you three ember, it'd still be an okay artifact, and that's the the lowest thing you'll get from Hell's Banners. And then the highest thing you'll get is three ember every damn turn, which is not that un unlikely, uh, depending on your deck. Three ember every turn, pretty busted. Not only is it three ember every turn, it's three ember every turn that, you know, say your ember drained a bunch, you still can make that ember happen as long as you have zero cost units you can put down. So it's it's like you you can gain or or if you have like an X cost you can play it then put down like two morsels and gain back three ember to then do other stuff. It's so versatile in what it can do. Pirate Stone Housing, also no surprise here. I didn't really take this as much pre DLC, but post DLC it's a little bit more needed. Usually, it's often you want to add maybe an extra health upgrade to a unit, or if you can fit like a quick or a multi strike onto it, that's pretty nice. That's usually the iterations that I would use Pirate Stone Housing for. I'm generally not like doing it. Uh, if I have like an endless unit, it's usually like some token. Um, I suppose Endless Eggs would like it, but... And then Cheater's Hand. Uh, that's that's a that's a pretty good one. And and I will say, I, I didn't like it for a little bit, uh, because I think I just misunderstood what its purpose was, right? The purpose is that it's a makeshift permafrost, essentially. Um, it's not a, it's not a card that actually helps your draw even though it reads that way, right? But if you think about it, it does no it does not help you dig through your deck quick quicker. Uh, it does not help you increase your hand size, and that's the two things you're looking from for card draw, right? So it's not it doesn't help you with that, right? What it does is it allows you to selectively take a card and hold it till the next turn. That's the big advantage of Cheater's Hand. Once you realize that, it becomes a pretty damn good artifact. Um, and then so on and so forth, Split Anvil, you know, Karuska, these are all good things. I don't know if I have the the need to really dive into every artifact here. You know, you can kind of, I'll just scroll through them, and if you're interested, you can pause the video. Um, I'll go through all of them here. And this is just page one, we'll go to the next page. Um, just going to scroll through them. Not really saying much. Penitent remains there, and then yeah, and then if I go back, we'll really quick just sort by the win rates. Not too worried about these ones where the sample size is super small. Like I don't think comparable to Spike, I almost never take it. So the only times I did take it, obviously it was like gonna be good. Um, I'm surprised Impsicle only has 12 for me, but it is pretty interesting that it's 12 and zero. Pretty insane. Definitely shows that that's probably a pretty good artifact. Um, Shard of Divinity, that's not much to say there. I'm, I go a lot of, I, you, if you know me, I like to take a lot of shards, and I end up with Shard of Divinity and blank pages quite often as a result. Usually the Shard of Divinity is irrelevant, so that it, you can look at this and be like 25 and 1, oh my god, it's so good. But honestly, most of the time, I don't even get hit on my pyre. So there's been a few runs where it saved me, but for the most part, it's pretty irrelevant. Ashes of the Fallen, on the other hand, that's a damn good artifact. If you know me, you know I love imps. And this just makes those imp builds go into overdrive, and it's pretty damn hard to lose an imp run with Ashes of the Fallen. 25 and 2, pretty hard to deny the power of that. Abandoned Stave, I probably need to take this more often. I've been getting fancy and trying to take the Calcified Embers or just skip the event, and I don't... Uh, it's probably not correct, but... Yeah, hard to deny 12 and 1 there, even though 12 and 1 isn't a huge sample size. You know, you're, you're adding two blights to get two ember. That's a pretty good trade off. Um, and uh, Dante's Cloak, that just means you, you survived the candles and now you have Dante. No surprise that at that point you're winning most. I only lost one, and it was, it was a bullcrap game that I lost anyway. I'm, I'm still salty about that one. Um, Gurg's Goad, I mean, no surprise there. I, you don't, I guess I don't end up taking it so much because often by the time I see it, it's too late. It's like, uh, maybe it just gives me multi-strike on a steelworker or something. 
You obviously only want to take it if a relevant demon can get the effect, but if you if it is, that's free multi strike, and obviously that's busted, right? Cursed Vines might have my um, vote for most underrated artifact right now. I think most people like it, but they they think okay, it's it's Cursed Vines, right? It's actually pretty bustedly good. It, it's in crazy how it's crazy how versatile this artifact is. Shout out to the devs for this rework too. I mean, it was an utterly useless artifact before. And now it's just so awesome. It's a counter to Diligent. It's a um, easy way to trigger an incant. It's an easy way to rearrange your units or their units. Early game, it can kill units. Uh, even late game, it can like break the spell shield or something or the damage shield. Just so versatile what this can do. But really just the rearranging of units. Also the sacrifice... The the sacrificing of your own units is also really good with it. You know, imps, tombs, anything like that. It's just so versatile what it can do. Um, and even if it doesn't do a whole lot the moment you take it, often it will t do stuff by the end of the run. Just the fact that you have it now opens up some options to you, right? You know, you can take a sketches and shuffle your units around and stuff like that now. And uh, yeah, th not a whole lot other, other to go in here. I mean, Railhammer 25 and 3 pretty ridiculous. Uh, now if I switch it, again I don't really care about the too many of these low um, low count things, which really is the ma majority of these at this one rate, but like Vote of Key for example, I don't think it's a bad artifact, I just think it's very easy to screw up a run when you by taking it, so you really have to think five layers deep on what every possibility of what your end might run up as or what your rent bleh, can't talk yeah this is why I need to do multiple videos even this one is too long but uh, I, I'm gonna stop it after this I think so we can go into another video I need a break uh, but anyway votive key we we're talking about votive key can screw up so many runs and you have to think like five layers deep like where is your deck headed is there any way this is gonna screw it up in the future or now and very hard to really get all the considerations in there and I you know contextually I can remember just most of my losses here because I did that and I made an incorrect evaluation and it just ended up screwing me over in ways that I hadn't predicted but conversely the one the time it's also carried runs for me before right so it's just a very tricky artifact it's not an easy artifact to figure out uh, when it's good and when it's bad and I'm still obviously sussing that out um, and then like some of these other ones, it's like Golden Vault isn't bad, it's just the context, you have to think of the context sometimes, like with Golden Vault, you would be taking it, in my opinion, if you're in a dire situation already, right? You're taking this because you think, wow, my deck sucks, it keeps leaking, I'm about to die, the, this gives me a chance at living, right? That's kind of the situation I would take Golden Vault in. Um, so it's like, yeah, maybe I've lost an equal amount as I've won with it, but that's just because, like, I wouldn't really take it if I don't think I'm going to die, because it's just going to cost me gold, right? Uh, so I'm only taking it in a bad situation already, and if I'm in a bad situation already, well, I'm probably at a high chance to lose. I can tell you that I don't think it was ever the reason I lost. I can tell you that it's probably the reason I won a lot of the time. I mean, three of the time. Definitely saved at least one of my runs that you can find video of. Um... And then yeah, so on and so forth. You can you, a lot of these. I just don't take them. Like I don't. I don't think very highly of Melting Spout. I I don't see why anyone really likes this one. But and even when I look at other players' data, which let's just do that now real quick. Um, I don't know if the other players' data here is necessarily significantly more or less interesting than what we just looked at. I think it is. I mean, like when I sort by win count, like I said, it's the same. Uh, same, or at least the rank here is the same. You know, draw is taken more than pip, which is taken more than ember. Uh, the only difference here, I guess, is that uh, ember doesn't have a higher win rate than the others. It's kind of right there with pip. And even, I would say draw, it looks like draw is taken at an even greater rate for them, while also having a clear win rate advantage. So that's just further evidence that 
you really should take draw most of the time. If there's ever a question about what your deck needs, probably just default to draw. It's probably just correct to go draw if there's any questions. You really should go Pip and Ember when you have a very specific need for them. And isn't this funny? Remember Hell's Banners was my number one, like, sort of non-default artifact here? So it's the same with the other players. And it's also winning a lot. Like, uh, Lost Luggage, Improved Firebox. Funny how all three of them are all about setup, right? Just shows how powerful setup in this game is. Turn one is important. Turn two is important. Uh, anything that helps with that. Now, Wing Steel, there's where we'll see some divergence. I, I hate this uh, artifact, but I'll admit that it's probably pretty good, right? I just often... If I can find any reason not to take it, I will, because I am so bad with this artifact. It screws me over way more than it doesn't. And here's the thing, um, and I will say, you know, of, of the players we've looked at, a lot of them don't reload. Some of them, I think, do, um, which is not a good or bad thing. But I guess for me, from the perspective of Wing Steel, when I'm trying to commit to no reloads, it's more devastating when you fuck up a wing steel, right? When I fuck up a wing steel, and when I'm in a no reload situation, and I draw like the card I was digging through my entire deck to find, and my and my whole game plan relies on it, and I accidentally draw it and can't play it, like a holdover card or something or a unit. That's game ending, right? That's why I'm so hesitant to take wing steel because I know I know myself, and I just I fuck it up too much, but. In an ideal scenario where you're not fucking it up, it's a pretty damn good artifact, right? It's basically a draw upgrade. I guess another reason I don't like it, though, is that even if it is a draw upgrade, it is it is one where you draw after your ember is off, often spent, which I find makes it pretty non-ideal. Generally in card games, if you have the ability to draw, you want to draw first. You want to see your options. Uh, before before they're ex kind of expunged, right? But Wing Steel is the opposite of that. The, it's like draw last, basically. But all that being said, Wing Steel is pretty good. Um, I just hate it. Forever Flame, similar. It's like it's kind of setup related, but it's even beyond setup related. It can do things like make all your imps free, including Transcendent. Pretty damn good artifact. Pyrestone Housing, that was also a top one for me. It's a top one for them. It's just become pretty good. Faulty Loader, it would be higher for me, except there was like the first two months I didn't think much of the artifact, so I didn't I was always skipping it. But I'm pretty on board with Faulty Loader now. As I, as we've said, setup is so important. And Faulty Loader also helps with that setup. You know, you're not taking damage from the first wave, you're not taking any pyre damage. You can even just focus on uh well, you'll take pyro damage if they survive, but they're probably, you know, you don't have to scale as hard and quickly to kill them. It's just a pretty good artifact. It also stops, like, sc scourge shufflers from shuffling scourges at first wave, yeah, all the way on up, too. Split Anvil, no surprise there. So many high-cost spells that now just are a benefit to you. Vapor Funnel, that's one I don't find myself taking too much, but, uh... Hard to deny that it's bad, right? Because it's doing pretty good for people. So on and so forth. I'll, I'll do the same um, here, where I kind of scroll through, and you can, if you're interested, um, you know, pause and just check out any of this that might be of interest to you. Page two here, just kind of going through here. Just to reiterate, this is the players that are not me. This is everybody else. See probably some different, you'll see similarities, you'll see differences. And I like looking at the differences, because usually that clues me in that I've been missing out on something, right? Like, let's say I had never taken Faulty Loader, and I see them taking it a bunch. Right there, I'm like, okay, well, this is clearly a good artifact. There's no denying that, right? That's just kind of an, ob obje an objective truth, shall we say, is that it is a good artifact. So if I had tried to say, oh, this artifact sucks... Like, I can't say... I can't say... I can't in good faith say Wing Steel sucks. I can say I hate it. Which is true, but no way does no way is does it suck, right? So that's what you can kind of glean from these. And then real quick, we'll also do the win rate. Cracked helmet, I don't know too much. I, that's it's the one that does piercing uh, to all your spells if you survive the 
two rings of damage shields. I don't know. I, I've never really done it, so I can't say, but clearly 7-0, and oh, clearly it's pretty good when it's good, but I, I guess my argument there would be, like, if you had a deck that was so good it could survive two uh, entire... Two of the worst rings, typically. It's typically rings four and five that you're surviving. Two of them of damage shield to every damn unit. I mean, it doesn't surprise me, even if you didn't take the correct helmet, that you'd have a 100% win rate in that situation. That's kind of my argument there. Similar like the Divinity and Blank Pages. It's like, if you if you made it that far in high shards, your deck's probably pretty good. Um, and also high shards just doesn't affect the Divinity fight that much. So it's like you basically powered up your deck at no real downside for the final fight. Um, Queen's Tale is an interesting one. 40 and 9. Hard to deny the power level of that. Mask of Penumbra, that's the one that... Uh, so Queen's Tale is the one where you put an imp down, it draws an imp, gives you an ember. Pretty good, right? Basically like a draw and an ember upgrade. Mask of Penumbra, basically a draw upgrade. And you can usually draw first with it, unlike Wing Steel, where you just put down a uh, morsel, and then you draw a card. Resonant Shard, it's basically like a poor man's deranged brute, which is still pretty damn good. It's just a, an additional damage per rage stack. Hard to deny 46 and 12 across a widespread of players, right? Resin Block, and this is probably, you know, I'm not I'm not hiding the skewed, um, the, the guy who really likes to run uh, Rector doesn't surprise me that something like resin block is pretty good there like if i if i if i hide that that'll be a little bit different here um so we'll go back to win rate uh so resin block see it's not really there anymore but the others still are resin block's still probably, probably up there i'd have to guess so yeah, well, it's somewhere. But we've, we've kind of spent too long on, uh, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot to go over with uh, artifacts. It's like you can see pretty, you know, Root Split Mask is really good. S stick them on the top floor. Heaven's Gold has gotten pretty good. Um, you know, leaks happen, uh, especially in Divinity, and if you can kill them, like, twice as fast, that's a pretty good thing. Um, but yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot... Like I said, I, I scrolled through everything. If you're really curious about any particular artifact on either mine or the rest of the player's um, data, just go ahead and look through that and pause, and, and you'll be you'll be able to look at whatever you want to look at. And then I think the final thing we're going to go over on this video was just some specific uh, clan combos. Since we've kind of gone over a lot of clan win rates and stuff, probably fitting that we finish with this. Um, so this is my data. There's, this data is always this is going to be pretty sparse because when we're looking at specific um, clan combos, there's I mainly play random random. Uh, the only time I didn't really during the DLC was the Tethys Drag situation, which we'll 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 look at here in a second. But so since I'm mainly random random, there's never one combo that's going to show up that much. You know, it's all up to RNG. Uh, but ironically, you know, my best combo is. Echo right with imps. I can't really say anything specific about that combo why it's so good. All I can tell you is that I'm eight and zero with it for whatever reason. And I'm you know I have a few of these where I'm it's like awoken with uh, sentient and wormkin echo breaks, six and zero. That doesn't surprise me too much because I've been running explosive sentient a lot and it combos really well with wormkin. Um, you know. Queen's Imp with, uh, or sorry, Shardtail Queen with uh, Primitive Molds. That's obviously, you know, uh, Viable is pretty big on that combo. I am too. I've always, you know, he, he would say that it's the strongest combo in the game, and I would not disagree with him. So 5 0 there. It might easily be the best one. I just have only gotten it five times versus like the eight times a lot of these other ones have, uh, has, have happened. And then kind of so on and so forth. It's hard to really suss out much here because the data is so sparse. But here we see, you know, let's sort by losses. And then you see why, you know, Tethys, I do think, is still my worst champ right now in the DLC. But the data is probably a bit lower than it should be. 
because of this. I ran so it's eight, uh, you know, fifteen losses versus three wins, pretty abysmal. Um, I think it's just a really tough combo, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. And I, I'll be honest, I never really did. Obviously, right? Three and fifteen, I never figured it out. Uh, I'd like to revisit it though. I think I've gotten better with both the Dregs variant of Melting and Tethys. Um, I'll revisit it at some point. I would like to redeem myself on that and try to get that win rate back. Uh, but then the rest of this is going to be random random. It is interesting that like uh, I did so poor with Rector and Echo Break. There's really no reason for that other than I probably just I had pretty bad Rector stats the first three months since the DLC, I think. But last month or so, I, I think I've done pretty good with Rector. I think I've won most of my games with him. So I expect that to turn around. And like I said, there's no reason that uh, it should be bad with Wormkin. To call out a... You know, I, <clears throat> the, the guy that runs Rector a lot, he specifically also ran Wormkin as a secondary for a lot of them. And had a hundred percent win rate, so clearly it is a good combo. I just, I just messed it up for whatever reason, and we'll see that here. I'll, I'll not hide skewer, and we'll just look at the other players' results first, uh, with them all combined. So if I go to wins, you know, right there, um, and this, by the way, is not just his um, data. So those losses, all of them are not from him. Like his were a hundred percent, but you know, he he definitely skews that win rate up. Uh, a lot of these, most of these, uh, you know, Rector ones right here at the 1 and 2 slot are going to be him. If I change that... It'll be a different story. You know, now we get to the more just uh, random random of everybody. Um, and actually the best is Firelight. Well, not the best. The, the one that accounts for the most wins, shall we say, is Firelight and uh, Fracture. And who knows, that could just be variance. I mean, it, again, that is so sparse at this point, there's not a whole lot to suss out. It is also interesting, though, that um, the Tethys and Queen's Imp does pretty poorly, 9 and 22 for a 29% win rate across pretty good spread of players. That's very similar to the Dregs combo, right? It has the same problems. It's like well, Tethys needs spells to be good, but when the basics are units of the other clan, that really fucks that plan up. Uh, also, a lot of the Stygian, almost most of the Stygian units are reliant on incants, or if they're not reliant on incants, it could be something like a Silophyte that still needs spells, right? Although I guess it doesn't hurt Silophyte that much, but mainly like incants. With incants, it just hurts it. It hurts Ancient Synergy as well, for what that's worth. It makes it significantly less powerful. Um, but, you know, for the record, I in my data, I didn't do too bad with Tethys and Queens, but that's really because I'm so good with Hellhorn, right? I didn't. I just basically ignore Stygian in that type of scenario, and I use my Hellhorn knowledge to carry those runs. Um, but it is worth noting that it's interesting that they kind of see the same problem that I've seen. It's just instead of Dregs, it's uh, Queens Imps. Um, now, real quick, let's take a look at what maybe some of their highest win rate ones are. So the 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 hundred percent win rate one is only one combo, which is Soul Guard with Plink or uh, Shade Splitters. Who knows? It's only three sample size. We know that it's probably good, but we can't say for any reason that it's like some significantly busted combo, right? Like. This one almost even looks better. It's like, because then you have a little bit bigger of a sample size at 7 and 1, 6 and 1, 6 and 1. So that's uh, Rector with uh, torches. I could see that being good, especially for like Harvest. You could torch like your um, tombs or dregs or whatnot and get some extra harvests. Umbra with melting. That doesn't surprise me either. That's like the reform DM. That's primordium with primitive molds. You can do the prim uh, the reform DM setup, which is just so powerful. Um, Echo right with shade splitters. 
again, I don't know if there's anything specifically about that combo that's busted. It's just, it's just whatever. But yeah, I think that's maybe a good stopping point here. We're almost at an hour and a half, so that's pretty long for this video. Um, I think next what I want to dive into is champ specific analysis and I'll even kind of throw in what uh, I kind of consider my personal tier list of champs. I think that could be pretty fun. I always have fun with those type of videos. I like watching other people doing them so it'll be fun for me to like do one myself. Um, but yeah that'll do it for this one. Hopefully this uh, provides some insight. Uh, after we do the champ one, I think we're going to look at cards, and then that's probably, that'll probably be everything. Um, and then I'll just look at any other additional data I have. Let me know if this is uh, insightful or interesting. Uh, and if there's anything that, by the end of this, I would say, you know, th there's at least two more videos coming out. Wait till the, the three are done, but if by the end of this there's stuff left over that you are interested in that wasn't there, please let me know. And I will look into if that's like data that I could pull or not. Um, it's possible that it could be. Like there's there's always still things that I haven't necessarily looked at that we could look at. But that'll do it for this one. As always, thanks for watching and peace.